Hello, welcome to Off The Shelf Reviews. I'm always surprised Christian Bale survived this movie. And I'm Gary, and today we're going to review and discuss The Machinist, which released in 2004 from writer Scott Coser and directed by Brad Anderson. Ian, why don't you give us the synopsis? Well, the story follows Trevor Resnick, played by Christian Bale. He is a machine operator at a factory, but he seems to be going for a very dark, turmoil-filled moment in his life. As we follow Trevor interact with many people inside of his life, we start to question who is real, what is real, and what has made this situation. I'm not laughing. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a film that uh, almost was never to be. Wow. Now, the, the, the script writer had penned this the moment he had left film school. Okay. And he shipped this around to every Hollywood studio, and they all rejected it on the grounds that the film was too dark, thematically, mm. or too strange for them to consider actually investing any money into making it. Now, we talked about the director not too long ago with Session 9. Yeah. And this is a wonderful collaboration between between these two. It was eventually... Uh, they eventually got uh, some funding and filmed this entire film in Barcelona, in Spain. Mm. And one of the things you'll notice with this film is that they very much make it feel like you're in L.A. Yes, and yes. the production company and the, and the crew dressing the sets for this film had to go above and beyond to make sure that it was American cigarettes, American license plates, yeah. American stop signs, traffic lights, you know, everything from branding to names to the actors to the extras. They had to Americanize everything. I think they pulled it off incredibly well. Yeah. And you wouldn't think that it was shot in Barcelona, Spain. <laughs> Now, one of the first things that you're going to see in this film, and it's going to, it's very uncomfortable viewing. You've probably seen it just from the the DVD cover or the poster now, or you've yeah. heard the the tales of Christian Bale's transformation in this film. He dropped from 173 pounds down to around 110, mm. and he was even willing to go further. Yeah, and the director and the crew were like, "Stop!" You can't like. The director was even, he was impressed to his commitment for the role, but like worried that he had pushed himself too far. And Christian Bale said he went on a diet of like one apple and a tin of tuna and lots of booze and cigarettes to sort of quell his appetite whilst he lost all this weight. Yeah. Only for, a, you know, a year later to put all that weight back on <laughs> and look more buff than I will ever look in the Batman movies. It's like, God damn, Christian Bale. He is a phenomenal actor. I mean, like, like we're talking about the guy who at 13 was working with Steven Spielberg in Empire of the Sun. You know, say what you want about his Terminator performance or, you know, like we said, with American Psycho. And I, I'm particularly fond of Reign of Fire. So, like, I will kind of always praise Christian Bale to high heaven, especially after Dark Knight, one of the best Batmans ever made. This movie came out and immediately I saw the posters and I was just like, you know what, I'm I'm good. I know he's a great actor, but I just don't think me seeing him put on this type of performance is what I need at this point in my entertainment view. Um, and so it wasn't until um, after The Dark Knight had been released, maybe even after Dark Knight Rises, that I, I had a chance to go back and watch The Machinist. And was like, yo, all right, Con and Bale, let's do this. I know you're good. You know you're fucking good. So where does this story go? And it's glad you, you sort of psyched yourself up for it. Because yeah. I think this film is definitely one of those that you have to be in the mood for it. Yeah. The film will put you in the mood and keep you invested. But yeah, you need to know what you're getting into kind of a little bit before you hit play on this one. Well, it's kind of like, weirdly enough, kind of like for me, American Psycho. You know, like American Psycho as well is one of those movies that you kind of have to know what you're getting into because once you get in there, the shock's going to hit you at some point and you can't just turn it off. Well, at least with a film like it. this titled American Psycho, you <laughs> kind of get an idea. With The Machinist, it's so ambiguous. Like, what is that about? Yeah, but with that, like I said, that skeletal figure, you know, on the poster, you know it's not going to be a nice warm movie. <laughs> right. And we get that phenomenal start with with Bale kind of, you know, he's he's dealing with a body. We don't know why, um, but it's rolled up in a carpet or who. And he's there and he's smoking a cigarette and he looks gaunt. He looks like shit, you know, and he's 
it's very surprising that he's able to carry this body at all to where he needs to take it and he takes it to the ocean great shot of the beach there it's night time he gets the carpet he puts it on the edge and as he's watching for that security guard come up he kicks it and the body rolls down and then it cuts and it fades away right and then we're right into what the sex scene with him and jennifer jason lee <laughs> yeah and that's where we really get to see him fully you know almost naked and we can see how skeletal he really is and uh, she makes a comment which is sort of echoed in the film as well. Yeah, that yeah. If he was any smaller, he would disappear entirely. Yeah. And that's sort of the mental state that the Resnick character is in. Uh, we don't know why, but we know he's dealing with something. Um, past trauma, guilt, perhaps. Yes, yes. And, uh, and him, his self-destruction is sort of a side effect of his mental anguish. And that is what this film is actually about um, through through trying to piece together what actually happened in his past that's got him to this point. And the film is littered with clues about it. And the film is essentially a mystery mm. because it's not long before he sees the Hangman game post-it note on his fridge yeah. with the letters missing. And as the film goes on, mysteriously, it's like somebody is entering his house and filling in it for him, trying to tell him something. What? Well, I guess that's what we watched to find out. Well, I guess I better be getting back. I hear that Tucker guy can be a real prick. You got that right. I'll see you around. Yeah, it's phenomenal, phenomenal to watch this unfold because... Like, I'd wikied it before I'd watched it the first time round, so I kind of already knew, and this being the second time round to watch this, I already know in the back of my head Resnick is a bad character. Even though the way the film starts off is like, he's nice, you know, he gets all that fun and camaraderie messing around with all of his buddies at the workshop. You know, we've got the phenomenal fucking Michael Ironside playing yeah. Miller, you know. <laughs> soon Miller as you time. See, yeah, as soon as you see Michael Ironside, you're just like, yeah, this movie's going to be fucking good. You know, we've got uh, Jackson played by Lawrence Giller Jr. You know, you might recognize him from The Wire. I recognize him as Bad Meat Bob from fucking Walking Dead. You know, he's just a phenomenal guy. And him and his back, back and forth with Jones... You know, another a familiar face from The Wire and they're, they're mocking each other. And then they start to mock Resnick. Uh, but Resnick's smarter. Or, or he doesn't mean to be. He just knows the system. So, like, he's able to bounce back the banter to them. But he's also able to take on Tucker, the, 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 the shop foreman in the, in the factory. You know, and, and Tucker's just like, you made my shit list. And you're like, oh, well, he's just trying to be stand up for his buddies. He's trying to be a friend. And I'm like, nope, Resnick is bad. You can just tell there's something going on. And that's why, like Gary said, he's on this self-destructive path. It, he doesn't see it. He, he, he thinks what he's doing is okay. So it's like when he goes to the airport and he's talking to the waitress. And she's trying to force feed him pie. And he just ignores it. He's spending all of his money, like he's he's got nobody to care for. All he's doing is drinking coffee, smoking cigarettes, and he's working all the time, 24-7. He, you know, he says to Je Jennifer Jason Lee's Stevie character at one point, like, I haven't slept in a year. Now, he should be dead. Yeah. I think the world record for not sleeping, I think, like, I think it was 11 days. Yeah, something like that. And I think that person died. No, no, I don't think they died. I don't think they did. I mean, there might be some torture methods. Uh, I don't know about. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's physically impossible. But it, I can imagine he's not... I imagine he has slept, but he's not aware of it. Like, he's yes. so self-tortured that even maybe in his sleep state, he's, you know, still in his in his waking nightmare. And and throughout the film, every time it looks like he's about to fall asleep, something disturbs him anyway. Yes, yes. Um, so, yeah, we don't actually see him sleep at all in the film. But, yeah, in reality, it's a physical impossibility. And, and for me as well, as an experienced film watcher as well, I've seen this a number of times, especially in dark movies like this, that if your main lead is having trouble sleeping... And then is seeing things appear and can't explain how those things got there. 
It's usually them. Well, yeah. I mean, I mean he's, he's definitely suffering from a form of, like, PTSD. Yes. Uh, uh, which has brought on the amnesia and the insomniac kind of feel. Uh, and he starts seeing this this other guy this, yes. that, that nobody else ha- has any knowledge of. This guy, Ivan. Yes. And he starts to appear in his workplace. He starts to see him in this fancy fancy Firebird car driving around town. Yeah. And he's like, who is this guy? Why is this guy, like, always turning up around me? I've been here. I work in a pit. I just picked up Reynolds' shift. Where's Reynolds? Feds picked him up. Or Warren. And he's got such a connection as well to Ivan as well. Like, the first time they have their discussion on the outside, you know, Ivan gives him the explanation that he's replacing so-and-so, you know, and and he's just here for some overtime. But it leads up to the sequence where, like, Miller, Michael Ironside's character, needs help with this machine. So he calls over Resnick, and Resnick's kind of helping him, but he's feeling distracted and I would have called fucking anybody else except this half asleep looking skeletal motherfucker and Resnick is distracted by Ivan yeah. and Ivan makes the like the cutting motion across his neck to signify death or something bad's going to happen and Resnick accidentally backs into the machine activates it which ends up ripping off Michael Ironside's arm ah, it's a breaker ah, it's a Now, Michael Ironside losing an arm in a movie just elevates that movie even more, I think. <laughs> it's right up there now. Total Recall. Total Recall. <laughs> fucking Starship Troopers. Yeah. Like, he just... Um, but it, 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 it works more for the story as well. So, like, now he's turned everybody at the factory against him. Nobody trusts him anymore. You know, even the people, even the, his bosses, who were kind of looking out for him and wanted to take care of him because they weren't too sure if he was on drugs or if he was suffering some kind of trauma. You know, they sit him down at the meeting and they're just like, right, explain to us how this happened. And so he's got to explain it. Look, I was distracted by this guy. Um, I'm really sorry. It took off his arm. And it turns out that Miller's happy because actually he's got a bit of a settlement out of it. Yeah, yeah. There's a, uh, it's a brilliant scene where uh, I mean, just going back to the other scene where they're where they're blaming him. Yeah. Um. Now we see we see Resnick pushing the stop button multiple times. He is trying to stop the machine. Yeah. And it does feel like there is some kind of supernatural entity or some some perpetrator that's actually forcing this machine to stay on and cause this bodily harm. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's very weird the way that it's portrayed. Uh, but yeah, Resnick's definitely the one that everyone's going to be blaming for this. He Nobody saw him accidentally push the button on. No, no. But he's still being blamed because he was the one supervising it happen. But yeah, it is a really great scene where, you know, he's, again, he kind of half awake in his apartment, hears a noise and he sees... You know, the, the extra letters have appeared in The Hangman. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he puts in the M himself, going, yeah. it's Miller. That's that's who is responsible. Because he also almost loses his arm in a machine accident. Yeah. And he thinks it's Miller out for revenge now. Well, not just that. He thinks that Miller and a couple of other guys at work are hiding Ivan from him. So that he cannot prove to people that Ivan is real which if he, he believes that if he can do that, then everybody will understand that it wasn't his fault and that Ivan is this big problem. But, you know, everybody that we... Every piece of evidence that we see involving Ivan is shown to us, I, I believe, from a perspective that, you know, he's chasing a ghost. Every time he sees Ivan... It's him driving away or cutting a corner, you know, where he's seeing the, him slightly there in the background. Even the whole part that he has with him at the bar when he's discussing with him, like Resnick says, I don't really drink, but I'm drinking now. So it's like he's drunk. He's talking to himself himself and he gets this picture out. And so he's so excited to show people this picture of Ivan and his work colleague. And then he loses the picture, and so he's unable to show it to his work colleagues. And then he sees the picture around Stevie's place. And he's like, what are you doing with this fucking picture? How did you get hold of this picture? And 
we've had this build up with Jennifer Jason Lee's character Stevie and it, it started off really nice like she loved him you know he's the best paying customer that she has and she really wants to take care of him but then he starts to turn up at her apartment like at really awkward moments awkward times where she's with other clients or customers or things like that and then the one time that he does turn up and she's been beat at, she's had a beating you know so she's all bruised and so you really start to question of what's with this relationship with them as well like what is real here so when he finds that photo and he's just like this is the guy i've been looking for and she's like it's you yeah and he, he can't believe it can he no and it's it's so sad because like like stevie is the only one of the only characters in this whole film other than the waitress at the airport yeah. that's shown him any kind of affection any kind of understanding and patience with him just to have him react so I mean, he's not. He doesn't get violent with her, um, but it's it, it's borderline on you know, because he's so angry with her, uh, especially when she forces him out the door, to, yeah. yells at him, and you know, I'm wondering like, we never actually see Stevie with you know, she's a sex worker. We never see her with any of her clients. No, we don't. Um, so well, we don't. I don't actually know whether th whether she is a sex worker. Yeah, yeah. Um, and now when we have the bruise on her face, I'm like, okay, she's had a really tough customer. It's horrible. Then I'm like, was it Resnick? Did Resnick do it? I'm like, he's not portrayed in the film at all as a violent person. No. Uh, um, so I, it makes me think maybe it's not. So I, it's one of those things where I, I really don't know. It's a little bit grey. I, I'd lend to believe that, yeah, she is a sex worker and it was some horrible yeah. crime. Just to contrast to Resnick and it wasn't him. Well, I really started to question as well, like I said, this being the second time, of who or what was real. Like... Like I said, we only ever really see Stevie in her apartment. Yeah. And we only ever see Resnick go to the apartment. We don't ever see anybody else go there. Um, and he goes, he'll go in there, he interacts with her, and then he leaves. But that all could be all in his fucking head. You know, he, he her, she could be uh, just another imaginary character like he's, he's created. Because, as we said, he keeps going to this air airport as well. And he meets up with Maria, played by... Aitana Sanchez Gajori. Um, and it, those are some of my most favorite sequences in the movie because she's playing nice and being really polite, and she really likes seeing um, Trevor come and speak for her, but she doesn't like what he's doing to himself. She doesn't like the fact that he's up all night. He does, she doesn't like the fact that he travels all this way just for coffee and pie and then doesn't even eat the pie. And, you know, he starts to question about, obviously, her her family, her son and stuff like that. Yeah. And um, they decide to go to the local theme park. So you get this really nice, wonderful moment where it's just the three of them walking around, him taking photos of Nicholas, her son, and Maria. And then Maria has to go off and, and deal with her ex on, the, on a mobile phone call. So he takes Nicholas off and they find the Route 666. Attraction ride. Yeah, yeah, horror ghost train ride. And the two of them go on to it. Now, first time you watch it, you don't pick it up. But second, third, fourth, subsequent viewing. You see that this, this attraction ride is littered with clues and hints as to the past trauma. And it, it's literally explains the entire backstory in this ride yeah and uh i just want to go back as well to a line that uh that, that trevor resnick had earlier mm. where he says uh, a little guilt goes a long way uh where he's talking to uh to uh, maria at the airport yeah and say, it's such an important line to this film and of course we see the hanged man in the attraction we see the sign of guilt yeah we see this child get hit by a car we see the gory remains under a blanket and uh, we, but there are flash cuts to like the speedometer of a car. Yeah, yeah. There's these flash images that are not part of the attraction that's in there. And the interesting thing is that Trevor is just like, oh, that's pretty scary. Oh, maybe you should cover your eyes, boy. Yeah. Uh, but of course, the strobe lights start to go off, and uh, he has an epileptic fit as he comes out. And it's that image of Trevor running out of the attraction with this, what appears like a dead child in his arms. Yeah, yeah. And we see the mother slow motion running over, and the, the whole film goes from this like uber realistic approach to this very stylized moment yeah yeah i loved the musical moments that that, that it had because it reminded me of the, the, was it the um 
the weird kind of 1950s sci-fi sure yeah you know musical instrument that they used to use and whenever i'd hear that i was like well, whatever i'm looking at isn't completely real you know it's kind of you know in his head it's gone completely out to the twilight zone but they have this connection now um where she ends up taking him back to her apartment and they share a bottle of wine you know and he, you know they're they're kind of getting close but she says to him about going and getting uh another glass of wine you know it's on the last door on the left which is quite sketchy you know it's like kind of a hellish journey there well just to before you continue that yeah, i just yeah. want to go off on a on a tangent here now Throughout the film, Trevor Resnick is given many choices to make. Mm. Just, just basically, whether it's taking a left turn or a right turn. Yes, uh, yes. Like one of the one of the highlights of that moment is when he's in the Route 666 ride and he's telling the boy to yeah. take right to salvation, but they end up going left down the highway to hell. Yeah. Um, and throughout the film, he's given choices and he always takes what's on his left, where salvation is on the right. The right path may be the more difficult choice. Yes. Like, there's a sequence where he's, like, in an underground sewer-type system. Yeah, yeah, And yeah. he ends up taking the left path, which is the easier path, out and, and away. Um, and her telling him that it's on the last or on the left. It's like, every time he takes a left turn, yeah. things are going to go bad in the film. Oh, yeah. Until the very, very end of the film small jump here where it's the airport in downtown yeah. and he finally takes a right turn wow yeah um, so it's just a little thing that's in the film but it's there because <laughs> it's, so it's really there uh, but yeah he does take that left turn uh, in into the kitchen wait well, that's it and he's he's looking to get her another glass of wine but he notices the mother's day card on the fridge and when he opens it up he sees uh or he recognizes the little stick man and woman in there as the stick man that he has on his paper so then he's you know, this is really the start. Like, the movie's not even very, kind of, that long. Like, an hour, 40 hour, and yeah. 50 minutes. Which, you know, it goes at quite a steady pace. It does. That by about the 30, 40 minute mark, you know that Resnick is now on this downward spiral of insanity. Of trying to work out who's this person trying to screw with him. Why, yeah. why is Ivan following him? What's his involvement with all the people that he knows and all this kind of stuff. But... Like I said, as a well-experienced film viewer, you'll pick up on the clues probably quicker than the film will yeah. reveal them to you. Now, this is something I also wasn't didn't quite pick up on as well, is the fact that Stevie's apartment, Marie's apartment, mm. and Trevor's apartment, they all look very identical. They, they do, don't they? It's almost like he's going back to the same room every time. Yeah, yeah. And so you're just like, so maybe they don't exist. Well, they don't. They can't. And also when he's in... Um, when he's in Marie's uh, apartment, he, she, he's looking at this glass bowl yeah, filled yeah, with yeah. water. Yeah. And towards the end of the film where he's packing up all of his belongings, the landlady's like, oh, can I have that? And he's like, oh, no, you can't. That's my mother's. Yeah. And it's just like, wait a minute. That was in her apartment. Like, like It makes me laugh as well when we start to see what happens to the fridge. Yes. You know, and the dripping blood. My mind started to flick to the voices. Right. With fucking Ryan <laughs> There's Reynolds. Gonna be decapitated heads Yeah, in there. decapitated heads and talking fucking cats are going to start coming out in a minute. But it's just... Like, like I said, maybe it's this director's way of being able to layer madness on top of sequences that you aren't just looking at the actor, you're looking at the background as well. Well, that was something that the writer uh, for this film said. He drew all of his inspirations from Dostovsky, yeah. uh, who wrote a book called The Idiot, yeah. which Trevor's actually reading, reading in the film. And when, when he was writing that book, he, he said he was feeling... You know, moments of amnesia uh, and instability, and the, and the book as well is also deeply layered in themes of good versus evil, yeah. right and wrong, innocence versus guilt, um, and of course, there's even characters in that book that are very similar, if not named after characters in this film as well. So the parallels and pulls there well, are. That's it. Yeah, I started to find out things. So like like Trevor Resnick's name is obviously a, a mixture of Trent Reznor from Nine Inch Nails, which obviously they took a lot of inspiration <laughs> yeah. from. I think Resnick kind of uh translates to like spiraling down to madness or something and so yeah and with the writer you know the writers there's influences from his literature throughout the movie like the license plates or certain numbers from certain chapters well and the, like it's, that. it's also the fact that that resnick's license plate number and um and ivan's is they're the same license plate, but one's reversed. Yes, yes. And it yes. just goes to show that he's not oh, real. He's a double. He's, he's he's you. It was fabulous because I was I was watching the sequence because 
Trevor starts to, you know, really start to follow after Ivan. He's trying to question everything that Ivan's doing. And he's unsure if Ivan is involved with Stevie as her ex-boyfriend. And he's the one beating her up and he's her pimp. And then he wonders if um, Ivan is Maria's ex. Because, like, he swears he sees Nicholas in the car with him at one point while they're driving. And wh while you're following that sequence, you can see Ivan's license plate. But it's, I think you see, or it's reflected in the mirror of Trevor's van while he's chasing them. And you can see both license plates are just reverses. Yeah. So then he's, he takes the license plate information to the police. Well, he t first he goes to the DMV and he has that awesome sequence where the guy's like, look, unless, unless it was, a, you know, there's some kind of crime involved, I can't give you the information. So fucking Trevor throws himself in front of a car oh. then he goes to the police station and he tries to sell it like he's been hit by the car here's the license plate can you give me the guy's address and then the police officer comes up to him and is just like um this is your car you said it was stolen like a year ago now you can also imagine with but hindsight to the end of the film that the police are very much aware of the crime that this car has uh, been involved in yes. and have been since looking for it because, well, they've never found the culprit. He might be sat in front of them right now. Yeah. Uh, but he makes a run for it. <laughs> I don't know how. <laughs> how this, does he do it? This wafer-thin man is able to outrun the police. Um, and also, Christian Bale said he actually found it kind of euphoric uh, being in Barcelona. You know, he did, wasn't affected by the heat under yeah. his physical condition. But he said doing the running scenes, he said it took a toll on him because he said he had no muscles left in his legs. No. So that there literally wiped him out doing those scenes. Yeah. But uh, he manages to escape from, from the law this time around. Yeah, and he starts to, you know, he, he starts to, like I said, look into more information about Ivan follows him back to his apartment or at first we don't realize it but he follows Ivan back and watches him take Nicholas into this apartment and then when he walks in he realizes it's his own and he sees Ivan there in the in the mirror getting himself ready you know I loved this guy playing Ivan, I thought he was so good. It's so good, especially like he's going up against Christian Bale, right? Who is like acting his fucking bones out, you know. And Ivan, Ivan is like the complete opposite. Where where Trevor's really thin, Ivan's larger than life, you know. In the description about how he lost his deformed his hand, hand his yeah. deformed hand, you know, in the the back history, the way he's kind of shaving himself with the knife, like like it fully implies like he's killed Nicholas, and that you know, like. Trevor is obviously going to be the hero at the end of it. And they have this scuffle in the bathtub, uh, in the bathroom. And he slits fucking Ivan's throat. Which is, you know, kind of a bit unbelievable that he'd be able to, in his state, and how thin he was, have the strength to take out this huge man. But of course, it's all psychological. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But then we get that sequence. He's wrapping him up in the carpet. He's taking him out to the, ri uh, out to the sea, out to the river. And we realise that's... That's where we were at the beginning of the movie. Yeah. And then once he watches the body roll down this hill and just disappear. The body vanishes the moment it unrolls. Oh, it's yeah. amazing. Just now, brilliant. Here's another little thing uh, in the film that you're probably aware of. And that is that any time that, that Trevor looks at a clock, it's usually 1.30. Yes. And it's a significant time for this character for the events that took place you know, before the film started, yeah. but also at one thirty throughout the film is, is a moment where something pivotal or a revelation would occur. Uh, interestingly as well, that it's also at the one hour 30 mark of the DVD that the film goes, here's the answer. Right. <laughs> nice. I like it. And we find out, we see, we see Trevor not looking gaunt, not looking skeletal in his car, trying to light a cigarette, speeding, and he hits the child crossing the road oh man it's so well filmed because you see it a number of times you see that junction a number of times yes and the film doesn't try to hide it like look look at this really big huge thing in the background you're going to remember that and every time you see the junction you know he's speeding after he like there's a couple of times where he speeds through it look after ivan yes doesn't he and almost causes accidents or he stops there right in the middle and it's just really iconic to the point that when we see him hit nicholas 
at this junction, and then we watch Maria run over the to her The same son. run we saw from the uh, from the from the uh, traction ride. Yeah, and you know the film just. It's not like an avalanche it's just, or, or like an unload of information. Like I said, if you're experienced, you, you kind of knew what was coming. But the movie just goes, here you go. This is what he's been. This is what he's been hiding from for a year, you know, and he just he just drives off. And from that point, like this being my second time watching this movie, I started to question everything at this point. So like when he when he got out of that car, like and he just told the police that he'd, he'd lost the car is that when he started to not eat and not drink you know is is that the point where he started to not sleep did he continue to have this relationship with stevie was he with stevie before the accident did he dump her after did she dump him is everything that we've seen with stevie real or was it just his mind playing on that i know for a fact that everything with maria and nicholas wasn't real but yeah. at what point because when he goes back to the airport you know, and she and it's a completely different waitress. She's like, I talk to you every night and you don't say a word. Now you're finally talking. And you're like, oh, my God, it's fucking Fight Club <laughs> and Memento all over again. It absolutely like, is, yeah. What? You know, <laughs> Ivan turns up again. Ivan's like, ha you can't kill me. Exactly. It's just like when you think the good is overcome, you know, or, uh, to you know, killed his, his evil conscience and rolled it into the water. And it's just there waving the flash like, no, nope, <laughs> like, still here, mate. Um, and that's because he needs to finally confess and resolve his sin of, of of hit and run. Yeah, basically, and he does takes himself back into the police station. We see we see them put him into this white lit room, well, which has this heavenly glow around it. And Trevor sits down, and and he just about falls asleep. And the credits roll. So he has salvation. He has resolution. He has an opportunity to recover. But the film also leaves you going. You killed a child, mate, and you drove off afterwards. Oh, this is it. Like, <laughs> like, so that you get that moment as well while he's driving with Ivan. Like, he's he sold his apartment. He's told his landlady, look, I'm not coming back. I'm getting rid of all of my stuff. You know, and like I said, we had that moment where he could go to the airport or he could go to downtown to the police station. And, you know, there's a moment where you're thinking he, he could go to the airport because that's what he's done and for continue most of the movie. Continue to run, yeah. Um, and then he does, go to the, he does go to the police station and I sit there and I'm just like, what was what was real? You know, like, like, did he even go to... Was he working at the factory before the accident or was the factory job the only job that he could get because he was hiding amongst the amongst the people like jesus christ what, all those moments where he wanted to get with maria that was all fake you know all the stuff that he was trying to help and the, the whole like we said the whole ride part where he saved nicholas that wasn't real you know and and i also questioned like when he got into that cell and he went to sleep he could have died yeah <laughs> you know like like the release of guilt from him that he's finally handed himself in but the way that he destroyed his body and he's gone to sleep his heart could have just given out and he's died now, but it's a good thing because oh, he's resolved his yeah. his guilt. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, that is what this film is, isn't it? It's a cautionary tale. Yes. Uh, about living with guilt and how it can have a complete transformation yeah. Oh, yeah. on your body and your mind. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Don't get distracted while driving as well. It's completely bad. Well, yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> What were your favourite scenes from The Machinist? Or most memorable? Oh, man. Uh, a lot of my sequences, uh, my most favourite memorable sequences were the the waitress and Trevor chatting. You know, like, like Christian Bale has such phenomenal sequences throughout this whole movie. So I could talk about the whole movie. Um, but, like, better than Jennifer Jason Leigh being topless in her sequences were the line deliveries between Bale and Maria because like it's heartbreaking to know that none of that is real you know by the end of the movie to, and especially like the Mother's Day yeah you know conversation oh like what are you going to do for Mother's Day and she's just like oh we're going to go to we're going to go to a, a, an amusement park you know it's my day but I want to spend it with him and I'm like I get I get that as a parent you get that but it's also like the 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 back and forth where she's just like, what about you? And he's just like, cemetery. You know, he just, my mum's my mom's dead. And you're like, I, I, I kind of get that. And you get that moment as well, a beautiful moment where he's sitting through the uh, f 
photographs. Yes, yeah, yeah. You know, and he's looking at his past. You don't ever really find out a past about Trevor Reznor. Like, was he a bad guy before he had it, the accident? You know, was he just a drug taking Just reckless, pimp yeah. And he was reckless, you know, or maybe this was just, he was just having a happy day and he just happened to look down at his lighter when, when wasn't paying attention. Like, the arm bit with fucking Michael Ironside. <laughs> Gotta love an arm rip with Michael Ironside. See you at the party, Victor. See you at the party, Miller. You know, I love the Miller bit where the confrontation between them two. Yeah. You know, like he's just like, I know it was you, and Miller's just like, like you need to leave. And then he just cracked him one with his one good arm. Uh, I love that sequence as well with um, you had that awesome shot of Ivan stood next to the car in the stormy background. Oh yeah. You know, behind yeah. him and him smiling, it's just. Yeah, great, great, great. Oh, yeah, this film's packed with memorable moments. Uh, the first one I want to bring up is the uh, A Little Guilt Goes a Long Way, that conversation at the airport uh, yeah. diner. And, and that one line in itself literally sums up this film. The uh, the whole conversation, again, at that, that diner uh, about Mother's Day and then the subsequent trip to the amusement park yeah. and the whole Route 666 ride and all of the imagery that's in there just literally just showcasing everything that, uh, that that Resnick is about or all of his guilt. So whether all of those were the actual attractions in that ride yeah, or whether yeah. it's just his consciousness was projecting there, it. Was there even an amusement park? Well, exactly. Was, was he just it's sat in his, his apartment? mind tormenting him oh, some man. more. Yeah, Miller's accident, that arm loss scene, it's like the like the film's not gory at all. Uh, but that scene is, is pretty nasty. And when you see the machine bit still spinning with a part of his arm <laughs> left in it, just like, oh, man. Yeah, man. <laughs> Uh, the it's you in the picture revelation moment yes. and his disbelief about it was just yeah just and then the the performances from Jennifer Jason Lee and Christian Bell that that heated argument was was really well acted really well performed nobody wants you here nobody yeah that that's like it hits hard like because I mean, you're still very sympathetic to Trevor throughout this plight because we don't really understand the ordeal to that extent and to yeah. see him just so vilified by everyone even though it wasn't really his fault in this accident but it was but it wasn't uh to be so hated though by everyone and him just watching christian bale take it and just walk through the car park afterwards it was like his performance is just really good bro like was the Miller accident even real or is it just a sim symbolic sim nature of the accident they had with the child because it technically wasn't his fault? And... Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then you've also got the parallel of the arm loss with the guy with the mutated hand as well. Yeah, and, yeah. and then, of course, him almost losing his arm in the machine. <sighs> yeah. And, of course, yeah, the ending, the... Uh... Uh, the, the the reveal that the one minute the one hour thirty mark where everything is explained the whole backstory and the whole reason for this film it's like, yeah. yeah really powerful stuff Ian do you recommend the machinist I fucking wholeheartedly recommend the machinist and I was saying this to Gary um before we turned the camera on it's like this for me is a properly good psychological horror movie um you know I wouldn't I, I I wouldn't necessarily normally say that, but after the second time of watching it, I'm like, you know what? This is a scary movie. It can be quite thought-provoking and quite traumatizing. And for all those other horror movies they go out there that rely on extreme gore or, you know, just sequences that are just so unbelievable, this movie takes something very realistic and very quite relatable to the right people and puts it in with a fucking standout performance from Christian Bale with some really great performances from everybody else who are supporting him with such a great twist that like by the end of the movie you say to yourself I never want to watch that again but in 10 years time you'll think to yourself man I need to watch The Machinist again and you won't want to but you should oh hell yeah this is getting my must-watch recommendation. It's a fantastic psychological thriller with outstanding performances and direction. Christian Bale underwent a total physical transformation in his method acting approach to honestly convey Resnick in a very believable way. He is uncomfortable to look at, and the film can be challenging viewing at times, but Bale is an expert in his craft, and you'll be captivated by his ability to bring this character to life brilliant, shocking and impressive, a real highlight of the film. 
The script and story is multi-layered, uh, but it's tight. Everything works under director Brad Anderson's directional eye, revealing rewarding viewers on repeat viewings in finding all the hidden details and clues that enhance the story further. The themes of guilt and past trauma and self-punishment are really strong within the film. It can leave you feeling haunted when the credits roll, despite being relatively a happy ending in confronting that guilt. The story may be predictable to some, the twist obvious, but the journey there through Resnick is expertly crafted. It's dark, gritty, thought-provoking, while being stylish and effective. This is a wonderful, independent movie. And I'm glad to see that it has reached cult status. How do you wake up from a nightmare if you're not asleep? Thanks for watching Off The Shelf Reviews.